take our Bibles now and turn to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. So we are uh, continuing with the Bible story. And we're talking about Abram. And this one is uh, the next installment in what some of the commentaries call the Abram Lot Trilogy. So there's three basic uh, uh, passages that deal with Lot. <clears throat> We looked at last week the choice where Abraham and Lot, Abram, Abram at the time and Lot separated with Lot heading towards the rich Jordan Valley and approaching the land of Sodom. And both men were very rich, the Bible tells us. And this was the source of conflict between them and their herdsmen and that was precipitated the separation and the change. Now, it is striking that how things turn out after the separation is made. Lot makes his choice based on earthly values, it appears. The Bible in the New Testament calls Lot a righteous man. So it's a curious story. And one wonders what would have happened if Lot had made a different choice. Like either make some kind of arrangement so his servants weren't fighting with Abram's servants. Or make some other choice, trusting God in another region of the country, not in that notorious valley where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were. What would have happened? Well, of course, we don't know. Here in not, uh, chapter 14, we are going to see once again God's work in Abram's life and powerful promises for the days to come. And one of the things that surprised me about this chapter as I read it is this, is not, this story is not about Lot at all. It's about Abram and his relationship with God. So there's a lot of striking things. And I think what we'll do is we'll read through the chapter as we go along, <clears throat> section by section, and then comment on it as we go. So the War of the Kings is what we call this. Number one, point number one, the War of the Kings. So verses one through 11. I think I'll read the first four verses here. And then we will stop there for a moment. Now it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Elisar, Ketelamur, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, king of Adma, Shem, let's see, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is, Zoar. All of these came as allies to the valley of Siddim, that is, the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Cadalamer, but the thirteenth year they rebelled. All right, so this is uh, so this sets the stage. Names all of these powerful eastern kings. So Cadalamer seems to be the central one in the story. He's the king of Elam. Elam is located in modern Iran, part of modern Iran. Its capital was Susa. You may. Uh, Recall in uh, Daniel, I think, and maybe in Ezekiel, the mention of Shushan, the palace. This is the city. So this is, this is in Persia, or what would become Persia. Persia isn't even an idea at this point. But the Elamites were located in that area. Ketelamer is king of Elam. So Amraphel, king of Shinar. Shinar is, an, Shinar is a name for Babylon. So he also comes from that area. Now, Ariok, king of Elisar, and Tidal, king of Goyim, we don't know anything about them. The only thing we can tell is Goyim means people. The Goy, okay, Goy is a person. So Goyim is people, more than one person. So, um, so we don't know, that's all we know about them. And one of the things that I should say that we're talking mostly, I think, of city-states. Not exactly empires, but city-states. That's why you have, they're mentioned as the king of this place, the king of this place. Especially the ones that are in the valley of the Jordan, they are kings of city-states. These cities are nearby each other, and they, uh, they are independent kingdoms, but allied. So they're allies. Now, the weaker kings, Bera king of Sodom, Beersha king of Gomorrah, we're familiar with them. Adma, we don't exactly know, but it must be somewhere in the location. And Zeboim, uh, we don't know exactly what that is. The king of Bela, he's not named, but it's identified that this is Zoar, which is a little city just south of Sodom. It's the city that Lot would flee to when the destruction of Sodom came about. All right, so, so these smaller kings, these western kings, 
were under tribute. What that means is that at some point in the history, these stronger eastern kings had, especially Kedileam, or had put these men under tribute. That meant they had to pay taxes to Elam, to Kedileam, uh, in other words, uh, if they didn't, they'd get beat up. And I've often thought about this as you look at the, you know, the kings and uh, uh, of various lands throughout history, it's basically like the mafia. As long as you pay your fees, as long as you pay your protection money, you don't get beat up. You, you know, but if you don't pay your fees, if you don't pay your taxes, they'll come and beat you up. That's the way it works. That's the mafia. That's the kings. You can tell I'm not a huge monarchist. <laughs> there, is, there is that aspect to it. The only monarchy I like is the one of Jesus Christ. So that's the one I'm looking forward to. Anyway, so that's what they're doing. And so these guys decided, well, we've had enough of this. They're far away. Uh, so we'll, we're going to quit paying taxes. We're going to quit paying the tribute. All right, so verse 5. In the 14th year, Ketelammer and the kings that were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karanim, the Zuzim in Ham, and the Emim in Shabbath Kiriathaim, something like that, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hezazon Tamar. All right, so let, maybe we should stop there for a second. So this is the campaign. So what do they do? The first place is in Syria. They basically are starting in the north. It's Syria, and they're working around the eastern side of the Dead Sea. Seir is the land that eventually will become the land of the Edomites, where Esau lives. And then they work their way around, and they come up to... What is it? Um, Kadesh, that's in the south of Israel. Kadesh Barnea, Kadesh Oasis. That's where the Israelites re would, it would come to refuse to go into the promised land. So they've worked right, way around. They're basically doing the exodus in reverse, coming down the eastern side, then coming up from the south. And now they have basically surrounded Sodom and Gomorrah, which are in the center in the land there in the Jordan Valley. All right, so that's through verse 7. And the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Admin, and the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bo Bela, that is Zoar, came out. And they arrayed for a battle against them in the valley of Siddim. So that's the valley of salt, where the Dead Sea is. Uh, we don't know how big the Dead Sea was at this time, but it was basically in that region where this battle happens. Against Ketelamer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariot, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. So, you've got four against five. The five might think they have a chance. Problem is, they don't. All right? Now, the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hell country. So, the eastern kings were stronger. And verse 11, then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and <coughs> all their food supply and departed. So, <clears throat> the battle didn't go well for the Western king. So here we are. <clears throat> uh, they sack Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities, and they say, all right, well, we've got our tax money, so now we go. All right, they're going back, and they, let that be a lesson to them. That's the whole idea. Now, what does this have to do with Abram's story? You look at this incident. This is just an, another instance of battles and wars between kings. We go through history. There's lots of these. And there are kings putting, on, putting their authority over another king. They're demanding tribute. They're demanding uh, obedience, etc. This is how empires are built and so forth. And so how, what does this have to do with Abram? Abram is this central character in the uh, Bible story. So what does it have to do with Abram? Here it is. Verse 12. The fatal error of the Eastern Kings. Verse 12. They also took Lot, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. That's interesting. This verse, if you look at the verse 11, are basically identical. They took all the goods of Sodom. They also took Lot. Okay, and his possessions and departed, on all their food supply and departed. 
All right. So th that's very basically a parallel. This is meant as an emphasis. Oh, thank you. I never drink water anyway, but thank you. <laughs> okay. I just survive. <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> but they also took Lot. So the implication of this is that Lot was not part of the military defense. Okay, so here he is living in Sodom. The men of Sodom have gone to war. Where's Lot? He's in Sodom. He is seen in this chapter, as one of the commentaries said, as a very passive figure. He's in Sodom and he gets captured. And the implication is, it seems to be, that he's being captured as part of the population. He's going to be sold into slavery like all the rest. Everything, you think about his uh, desire to go to Sod that valley. Well, I'll, I'll prosper down there. I'll, I'll get richer down there. Well, guess what? Now you're a captive. Now you're going to be sold into slavery. All your possessions are taken. But the issue is, this is Abram's nephew. Now, if the eastern kings had come in and just taken the goods, would Abram have gotten involved? Okay. I don't think so, but a fact is that Abram will defend his nephew, as we will see. So, Abram acts, verse 13 to 16. So, let's read that section. Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now, he was living by the oaks of Mamre and the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. Uh, he brought back all the goods, and also brought back his relative Lot, with all his possessions, and also the women, and the people. All right. So there's several things to talk about here. A fugitive comes to Abram and tells the tale. So Abram goes to war. Now notice what Abram has in his household. 318 trained men of war. Now, the Bible said to us that Abram is very rich. We don't really have a conception of this. Now, if there's 318 men in his retinue that are trained men, that are warriors... What is this? And how many people are in Abram's encampment anyway? If you've got 318 warriors, how many other people are there? Presumably they have wives and children, maybe parents. They're all in Abram's body, right? Abram is no small guy. This is his personal bodyguard. Yeah, Think about that. He's, this is his security force. Right? They're ready to go. Secret service, yeah, somebody said secret service. <laughs> okay? All right. So, and we'll find in verse 24 that he has allies. Because he says, I, I will, uh, we're going to share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre. Okay, so these are Canaanites who are in the land who are allies of Abram. So he has allies. So we don't know exactly how big this force is. But they were part of the fight. Now, the pursuit goes as far as Dan. Uh, apparently, so Dan uh, is in the north of Israel, south, just at the foot of Mount Hermon. And the, um, now, we have to say, it wasn't called Dan when Abram goes there. Uh, it's not called Dan until hundreds of years later when the tribe of Dan goes up there and settles there. Okay, that's in Judges, right? So that's at least 400 years away, more than 400 years away. And uh, so this is a bit, excuse me, a bit of an anachronism. Now Moses is not probably writing this down and saying, oh, I know in 400 years it's going to be called Dan, so I'll just put that in there. Probably some Israelite has, as they've been caring for Abram's, or Moses' documents, has added the name in, of Dan in, so that people know where it is, those who are reading in that time. Okay, they know where Dan is. All right, now I'm going to give you uh, a picture that Rob sent me. This is the site. Okay, this is Dan. You see these, these steps that are here at the bottom of this structure. Now that roof is 
That is modern, in case you were wondering. That, is not, that wasn't there then when Abram was there. Okay, so that's protecting the archaeological uh, finds that they have there. But you see those steps. This is some kind of a fortress. And I'll give you another picture on the side. Okay, so there's a model down in the forefront. So when Rob and Maureen were in Israel uh, a little while ago, or is that what in this trip? Yeah, yes. Okay, so th th this, this model in front is what the fortress would look like. Okay, and there's these steps going up to the gate, and there would be these secure walls. So this is the place where they had gone, and the, this fortress dates back to the time when Abram uh, fought against Ketelamer. This is one of the oldest archaeological digs in Israel. And you can go to, this comes from, or I went to a site called, uh, you just write T-E-L, Tell of Dan. Search for that, and you can find lots of information online about the archaeological dig and what they do, and you can even schedule visits, I guess, there. Although I'm not sure you'd want to go there right now, because they're firing missiles like mad over there. Okay, but <clears throat> anyhow... The former name of the city was Laish, is the former name of the city. Anyway, so the strategy is they come to Dan, and they're whole, I don't know if they're holed up in the fortress or not, but they're somewhere in this region. And so they divide their forces. And notice they also, let's see, what verse was it? Verse 15, so let's go back there. He divided his forces against them by night. Normally, my understanding is in the ancient world, they did not fight at night. Hard to see. They didn't have infrared goggles. You know, they're not, you know, those scopes on their rifles. So, so they didn't fight at night. They fought when they could see somebody, but they did this, they attacked at night. And they drove them out of that place, and it says they pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So north of Israel, all right, so then I'm not sure how many miles it is from, from this location, Dan, to Damascus. Damascus is one of the oldest inhabited cities in the world, continuously inhabited cities in the world. So, so that's up in Syria. It's, it's probably at least 80 miles. I don't know. Close to that. Close to that from, from where Dan is. And, so, and, they, and they pursued them north of Damascus. Okay? And so they really put a beating on this alliance of five kings. So that's, that's the point. And so then Abram, bring, the victory, Abram brings back all the goods and Lot and all the people. All right, and so then we come to the point of the chapter. Abram is blessed. Okay, so look at verse 17. Then after his return from the defeat of Ketelamur and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went up out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley. And I'm guessing that's probably what would be the valley of Jezreel or where Armageddon will be eventually fought, I think. Uh, and in any case, now Kizdek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He, he Abram, gave him a tenth of all. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, for fear you would say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten, the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre, let them take their share. Okay? So this is the disposition of this whole situation. But what is the thing? There's a, there is a contrast between uh, the king of Sodom and the king of uh, and Melchizedek. The king of Sodom came out to meet Abram, but Melchizedek brought out provisions. Okay, so it's you get the sense that the king of Sodom is somewhat pompous as he comes out, even though he's been defeated, even though he owes everything to Abram for recovering all the people and so forth, and and all the possessions, but he is still trying to put himself forward as somebody who's important. But Melchizedek comes out with provisions for Abram and his men. And Melchizedek, his first word to Abram is, Blessed be Abram. Look at verse 21, the first word of the king of Sodom. Give. 
Give me. <laughs> All right. All right. Give me the people. All right. So that's quite an interesting contrast. But the focus of the chapter is Melchizedek's blessing of Abram. And we know, of course, we, we've been through this in Hebrews. We've talked about this chapter. And we know the theological implications of this, but that's not what this chapter is focusing on. The focus is on this blessing. Blessed be Abram of God Most High. El Elyon is the Hebrew name for God Most High. Possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, El Elyon, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And so we have this. This is the centerpiece. Now, we, the reason this story is given to us is because Abram has acted in defense of his kinsmen, but God gives him a blessing through Melchizedek. That's the big thing about this chapter. And then we have something interesting in the distribution of the goods. Now, you notice I've given you the parallelism with the A, B, and then the A, and B, on, the, on that blessing. Now let's look at the distribution of goods. Abram gives Melchizedek a tenth in verse 20. The king of Sodom asks for the people, you take the goods. Abram declares his oath to the Lord God Most High, and here it is, Yahweh El Elyon. Okay? And then he says to the king of Sodom, I will not have you make me rich. Sodom asked, king of Sodom asked for the people, you take the goods. Abram's response, I will not have you make me rich. And Abram reserves the spoils of his allies. So he gives Melchizedek a tenth, and he gives to his allies their share, but he takes nothing for himself because he is a servant of Yahweh El Elyon. That's the center of this chapter. This is one of the great chapters of Abram's faith. Now, it's interesting that Abram has good relations with some of his neighbors, his allies, but a clear line is marked between Abram and the king of Sodom. He wants nothing to do with the king of Sodom. I believe that if, if Lot hadn't been involved in this, he would have just said, oh, that's too bad for them. He wouldn't have risked his men. He wouldn't have done the night march. He wouldn't have done the, the attack at night. He wouldn't have pursued them past Damascus. He would have just said, oh, well, too bad, so sad, you're had. <laughs> right? I think that's what he would have said. All right? But, uh, but Lot was there, and he trusted God. And Lot, despite his faults, is a righteous man. He has a relationship with God. Now, on a personal level, we can take this as an example of how to get along in the world. Some men we can work with, though they don't believe. Others we must keep our distance from. There are some people you just, you know, you, you need to keep a distance even though the, if you were to make a deal with them, you might make some money. There's, back when I was in real estate, there were some guys, you know, I really did not trust, I have to say. I would avoid doing anything with them. But the most important part of the chapter is the relationship Abram has with God, as demonstrated by the encounter with Melchizedek and the staunch faith of Abraham. And so we must follow this example very closely. May we bless the God Most High and serve him all our days. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we close this afternoon. Our Father, we thank you for this time to look at your word. We pray that it might be something that speaks to our hearts and guides us in our own way about how we should live. Lord, that we would be faithful to you. Lord, we're so weak and capable of sinning. Lord, I pray that you would help us and keep us in your ways. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.